I hear voices. They're all around me. I wish I could go back in time and tell myself to never play that damn game. They say I'm crazy, and maybe I am. Maybe whatever it is that haunts me took my sanity and hid it away. Somewhere where it's impossible to find it. Somewhere dark and sinister. Maybe they buried it deep down into the core of the earth and it's just sitting down there, waiting to be found. I sound crazy, don't I? You think I'm crazy and that's okay because I think I am as well. I'm gonna share this story and I'm gonna share it as much as possible. I don't care if you believe me. All I ask is for you to hear this story and don't make the same mistake I made. I'm sure you've heard of true hauntings, such as the haunting of Connecticut and Amityville, and maybe you've seen the movie The Conjuring that was based on true events. You never heard of this one. Those hauntings cannot compare to what I've witnessed. Nothing can. It was in 2005 when I came across some old abandoned apartment building. I had just finished the first semester of my senior year of college and was walking alone to my dorm from the bar. I was always alone. I didn't have many friends other than Jake and his brother Joel, my roommates, but they were always busy doing something else with their girlfriends, and I was always alone, hoping that a bottle of whiskey would solve my problems. When I came across this old building, I heard this creepy and demonic melody playing from inside. It sounded like a music box, and it was echoing somehow. I had this strange urge to go inside and find out where it was coming from. I threw my bottle of whiskey and it broke against the curb. I walked inside the abandoned building, something I would never do if I was sober. My footsteps echoed throughout the building as I walked the halls. Most of the windows were boarded and dust filled the air, clinging onto every object that existed. I could actually taste the dust as it broke into my mouth and into my throat, causing me to cough. I moved at a leisurely pace. Dust spiraled up into clouds as I wandered the halls, searching for wherever the music was coming from. I know it sounds stupid, but I was being drawn to that sound. It had some weird effect on me. I walked into a room and the music had stopped. The room was just like the rest of the building. Old, dusty, and dark. I used the light from my cell phone to examine the old paintings that hung on the wall. I noticed how weird it was that most of the rooms had furniture left in it. It looked as if whoever was living there just got up and left, leaving behind everything. As I searched the room, I had this overwhelming sense that somebody or something was watching me. I felt like if I were to turn around, something would be there. I turned around, but I didn't see anything, and yet I still had a sense that something was there. Something was watching me. I then heard the creepy melody echo from beneath the floor, and I had to find out where it was coming from. I don't know why, it just seemed like I was being forced to the sound, like I had no choice in the matter. The melody was coming from underneath a dusty rug. I pulled up the rug, dust scattered in the air like a dust storm. I felt the floor lightly shaking and it made a sound similar to a heartbeat. This sounds crazy, but it was almost as if the floor had a pulse. There was a door on the floor that opened up leading to some storage area. It was a deep hole, around 12 feet, which is why there was a ladder made from rope. I climbed down the rope, another thing I wouldn't do if I were sober. There wasn't much in there, just some old books, a box, and a creepy ventriloquist doll with long black hair and big, round, dark eyes. I noticed the strange melody was coming from the box. I picked up the box and started to climb the rope. I couldn't help but to fear that something would grab me and pull me back down. I made it back up and I played the game on the floor, shining light over it with my phone. It looked like a briefcase, but it was made of what seemed like black stone with some strange words, Ikidomari, carved into the center. I brushed the dust off with my hand and opened it. I noticed it wasn't a box or a briefcase. It was a board game. 
The structure of the board game was similar to the game of life, but it had a cemetery theme, and in the center of the board, it had what appeared to be a human heart inside a small glass dome. I've never seen anything like that before. It had six game pieces that took on the shape of tombstones and were made of real stone. On the right side, it had a deck of red cards and on the left were black cards. I noticed there was small writing carved in the inside of the game. If you dare to play, beware of demons. I figured it was all just for scare, so I did something I wish I hadn't done. I was just curious. Lonely, drunk, and curious. There was a wheel at the bottom right corner of the game that had numbers ranging from 0 to 9, and the objective was to spin the wheel and move your game piece to the amount of whatever number you spun. I placed a game piece to the starting point and spun the wheel. I watched as it spun around and around until eventually it stopped at four. I was going to move my piece up four spots when suddenly it began to move on its own. One, two, three, four. And then it stopped. I froze in fear for a few seconds. Normal people would have probably ran off by then, but for some strange reason, I just kept playing assuming there was a logical explanation for it. I've always been that way. I've always lived by what my father told me. Believe in nothing you hear, and only half of what you see. Apparently, when I spun a four, I landed on a black space. According to the game, black spaces meant you had to draw a black card. Black cards were more like tips or secrets. They weren't always bad. I picked up a black card from the deck. The words were in Japanese, but at the bottom of the cards, in smaller letters, they were translated in English. I looked at the card and read it out loud. Keep an eye on the doll. I looked over at the hole in the floor and I stood on my feet. I slowly walked towards it, lightly shaking. My teeth were grinding against each other as I got closer. I leaned over the hole and I felt as my heart knocked on my chest, begging to come out. There was no doll. She was just... gone. I quickly left the old building and ran to my dorm room, which was just five minutes away. My roommates were all there with their girlfriends, sitting on the couch while I burst through the door, suffocating in sweat and fear. I told them about what happened, without leaving out a single detail. They didn't believe me, of course. I'm not really sure if I expected them to, but I sure did hope they would. They called me crazy said I had way too much to drink, and they helped me to bed. I hoped they were right. I'd rather be crazy than to know what had happened was real. Almost a week went by, and I had forgotten about it all. I figured, maybe it was nothing after all, and that I made a bigger deal out of it than I needed to. I stopped drinking, believing that it would never cure my loneliness. It was almost an entire week since the incident and I thought I wouldn't have to worry about ever going back to that old building. I thought that my troubles were over, but I found out that they weren't even close to being over. They were only just the beginning. Something strange happened to me. Something only explainable in a Twilight Zone episode or a Stephen King book. I was in school as usual, walking down the hall to my class. It was strange because I was the only one in the halls, and the lights were dim and flickering. I heard a whisper as it echoed from behind me. Ikidomari. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I had no idea what was going on or why it was happening until I heard the music. It was that same haunting melody and it echoed through the halls. I started walking faster, scampering down the hall, but it seemed like I was just walking in circles. Everywhere I went, no matter how fast I walked, I was going nowhere. I kept walking until I saw somebody or something at the end of the hall. I couldn't really see who it was because I was too far away, but it looked like a woman. She was in a white dress, and her head was tilted at an unusual angle. Ikidomari, she said once more in a very unsettling tone that echoed through the halls. She had a Japanese accent, and I thought I was dreaming, but she was very much awake. She continued to whisper back, Gordon. 
we're waiting for you. I felt like I was stuck in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. She kept talking to me. I had no idea how she knew my name. Gordon. I see you, Gordon. Come back. The most creepy part about her voice was the somewhat happy tone and the way it echoed. I turned to my left and noticed I found my classroom. I walked inside. Everybody was looking at me like I was crazy. I guess they saw the fear in my eyes. I looked out into the halls and everything was normal as if nothing ever happened. My teacher scolded me for being late and I took my seat. I was clearly the only one who's experiencing the nightmare, so I didn't want to bring it up because I know that everyone else would say that I'm crazy and that I'm losing my damn mind. They wouldn't have been wrong anyway. I waited until I got to the dorm room to bring it up with my roommates. They again thought I was crazy and was no help at all. I've heard the haunting melody every night while in bed and every morning while in school. Something was haunting me, and I know that this sounds crazy, but it was the board game. I didn't know if it was cursed or possessed or what, but it was haunting me, and it was driving me to the brink of losing my sanity. It was nothing but that melody for a whole entire week until one day, something strange happened. I was alone in my dorm room. The other guys were out on dates like every Friday night. I heard the melody as it squeezed through the cracking of my window. It echoed off the trees and right down into my soul. I then heard a knock at the door and it startled me because it was a knock that I'd never heard before. Every one of my roommates had a certain knock, but that one was more like a pound, and every time I heard it, I felt my heart pounding along with it. I slowly walked to the front door and took a deep breath before opening. My father used to tell me to count to three if I were ever scared and then fight the fear with all I've got. I took another deep breath. The knocking continued, and I slowly began counting. One, two, one more deep breath, three. I opened the door. There was nobody in sight. I looked to the floor and there was an envelope. I picked it up and examined it. There was no name or anything. I opened it. My heart was knocking as I pulled out a black card. Ikidomari was written on one side. And on the other, we're waiting for you. They were haunting me, probably watching my every move for the past two weeks. They wanted me to finish the game, and they weren't going to stop until I did. It was as if I ran into a dead end I couldn't back out of. I kept the card in the sweaty palm of my left hand, and I waited impatiently and desperately for my roommates to arrive. And they were just as annoyed as I was when they heard me talking about the melody again. I told them about the knocking, I told them about how the game was haunting me, and the only way to get it to stop was to finish what I started. I guess showing them the black card was proof enough because I was able to get them to agree to go back to the apartment with me. They said the only reason they were doing it was to get me to shut up about it, but deep down inside, I know they were doing it because they knew something strange was going on. We gathered some flashlights and headed out to the old apartments. Joel brought his girlfriend Kenzie along with us. I didn't think they all knew exactly what they were getting into. I didn't even know, really. The only thing I knew was that I had to finish the game, or it would probably haunt me for the rest of my pathetic life. When we arrived at the building, I had this strange feeling that something was watching us as we ambled our way inside. They followed me to the room, jokingly calling out to the ghosts that I believed resided in there on the way. I was startled by the appearance of the doll sitting on the wall next to the old furnace. Her cheeks, if I wasn't imagining this, were smiling at me as I walked by. The game was just where I had left it, and had started playing that crappy melody when I picked it up and placed it on the table. I was surprised to find that they were hearing it along with me. That was when I knew that I wasn't going crazy. I wasn't the only one. In a way, it was a huge weight taken off my shoulder. Ikidomari? What is that supposed to mean anyway? Kenzie asked, looking at the carved writing on the board. She looked at me expecting an answer. I had no idea what it meant and I still don't, but it can't be anything good. 
We took a seat at the table, and all eyes were pretty much on me. I flipped the wheel and it spun, landing on six. We all watched my game piece, but it wasn't moving. Not like it did last time. I spun again, landing on four. Still nothing. I tried moving the piece manually, but it was stuck to the board. It was like trying to pull a nail from a wall with your bare hands. I figured there must have been a reason for this, so I read the rules that were written on the bottom left corner of the board. I wish I had read them before I played. The rules were very horrifying, and they pretty much went like this. Welcome to the game of Ikidomari. For your safety, it is highly recommended that you read the rules before you play the game. If you place a game piece on a board and you spin the wheel, there is no going back. You hit a dead end and there's no way around it but to finish the game. The game will not end until there's one person left alive. Otherwise, it can never end. Note, this game is designed for more than one player, so if you are alone, do not start the game. Consequences will be dire. Note, the game pieces tend to move on their own, so there is no need to move them manually. Not that you could anyway. Warning, to whomever dares to play the game, be aware that there can only be one winner, and the winner shall win the ultimate prize that sits in the center of the board. To those who fail along the way, rest in peace. Warning. Cheating is not tolerated and will result in dire consequences and an automatic ejection. When I found that the game meant everything that was said, the rules made it seem like this game was a death wish. I still to this day wish I had read the rules first. I wouldn't be here right now. Surrounded by demons if I had. Everyone else, I guess, thought it was just a game. They had no idea how real the situation was. Since I apparently already took my turn, Jake volunteered to go next. He placed a game piece at the starting point and spun the wheel. He rolled a seven, and his piece slowly moved up seven spaces, landing on a light shade of gray, which, by the way, meant that you didn't have to draw a card. Joel went next, and he spun a five, landing on a gray spot. Finally, it was Kenzie's turn. She placed her tombstone on the board and spun the wheel. Four. I knew, instantly, that would be a black spot because I spun that the first time. Her piece moved up four spaces and she drew a black card from the deck. I took a deep breath, probably more scared than she was. When I saw her reaction, I saw the fear crawl within her. Look behind you, she read out loud. We all took our flashlights and pointed them behind her. What the hell is that thing? Joel asked, not really expecting an answer. Wasn't that thing over there? Jake asked, looking at me, pointing to the furnace. It was the doll. She somehow moved from the furnace to the rocking chair that sat behind Kenzie without anyone noticing. She was just sitting there, the chair rocking lightly back and forth. At this point, I'm sure everyone realized how serious the real situation was. I heard their heartbeats echo throughout the room. They were just as scared as I was. I agreed to switch seats with Kenzie, who of course wasn't very comfortable with the creepy doll sitting on a rocking chair behind her. Not that I wasn't uncomfortable with it either. We got back to the game, trying to ignore the creaking of the rocking chair. It was my turn. I spun the wheel and landed on a seven. My piece moved slowly. I counted the spaces before it could stop. It landed on gray. Jake was next. He spun the wheel and landed on five. His piece slowly moved and stopped directly in front of mine. Shit. He muttered. He landed on a black spot, so he pulled a black card out of the deck and read it out loud. It's okay to be afraid. Because you should be. We were indeed afraid, and yet we were just getting started. The worst had yet to come. I took a deep breath, hoping nothing would viciously pop out at us. It was Joel's turn, so he spun the wheel and landed on four. A gray space. Kenzie spun the wheel and landed on zero. Her piece did not move, and it stayed put on the black space. According to the rules, that would still result in drawing a black card. She pulled a card from the deck, took a deep breath, and read it out loud. She's under the floor. We were all silent, 
and we listened as a voice echoed through. It's dark down here. The voice was echoing from beneath the floor. I can't sleep, Gordon. They all looked at me as if I knew what was going on. This woman or thing was haunting me. We heard a knock from under the floor right beneath us. The air was so cold and we actually felt a presence run through us. It was a horrifying experience, but we knew we had to continue the game. It was my turn, and I quickly spun the wheel and thankfully, my tombstone moved to a gray space. It was Jake's turn next. He spun the wheel, landing on nine. His game piece moved up nine spaces and it stopped on red. We hadn't had a red space, so we had no idea what would happen next. All that we knew was that the red cards were considered dead ends and were unpredictable and possibly dangerous. We didn't know at the time how deadly they'd be. Jake took a red card from the deck, and we all took a deep breath as he began to read it. A knock will rumble the room. Open the door, or be doomed. We all looked at each other, our faces frozen in fear. Then came the knock. It was loud. More like a pound, similar to the knocking that took place earlier that day in our dorm. It did rumble the room, and it echoed right through us. Our hearts becoming vulnerable and frail. Open the door or be doomed, I said, looking at Jake. I'm sorry, man, but you have to open the door. He looked at me, and I saw the fear leaking from his eyes. His face was pale as he took a deep breath and stood up. We watched as he slowly walked to the door. I realized nobody had shut the door, and yet, somehow it was closed without anyone noticing. I had an overwhelming sense that something bad was about to happen. The room rumbled again as there was another loud knock. Jake finally reached the door after what seemed like an eternity as he looked back at us. The longer he took, the more frightening the situation seemed. I couldn't blame him, though. There was no telling what could have been behind that door. It could have been something demonic. Something sinister. He took another deep breath as he slowly opened the door. I listened to the sound as it creaked open and I swear, everything was in slow motion. Gordon. Gordon. <laughs> it should just be like the lady from us. It should just be like red. Gordon. What's the button talk? <laughs>